Now, systems thinking is essentially the opposite to um, the process of decomposition, where as part of um, our thinking around problem solving, we break things down into smaller and smaller pieces until we can understand how to solve those individual pieces and gain a, a process by which we can solve the overall problem. Now that's good and it allows us to really get into detail and identify individual elements. But systems thinking takes the reverse approach, whereby we look at the problem and we look at all the other different types of problems and systems that are related to that problem, that can have an impact upon that problem. And we call this systems thinking. So the world is made up of various systems. We have an education system, for example. But within that education system, such as university system, you've got a tutoring system, we've got a lecturing system, we've got a student support system, there's a payment system for you to pay for things, there's a parking system, there's a library system. All of these systems interact with one another in various ways. And they all contribute towards an education system whereby you achieve some learning. So in schools, there's a whole range of systems as well. And in any problem that students are trying to solve, there's going to be a whole set of interconnected systems. And by understanding those systems, we can often see opportunities to solve the problem that we wouldn't see if we just focused on the obvious and tried to break it down into its smaller and smaller components. Often looking at how a system interacts with other systems, we can find the solution to making that whatever problem we're trying to address um, solvable. So an example we use is around bicycles. Bicycles are made of a whole series of interconnected systems that allow it to be used as a transportation device. We've got the chains that transfer energy from our legs to the wheels. You've got the tire system that makes the, the ride comfortable. If we didn't have tires and we just went on steel rims, it'd be very, very uncomfortable. There's a warning system with the bells. It might be a lighting system for illuminating things when it's dark or having reflectors so that cars can see the bike. Um, there's a comfort system in terms of the seating and the padding and the, um, uh, the, the spring systems on the seats to make it comfortable. So there's a whole range of interconnected systems. There's gears to make the riding more efficient. There's a braking system. And all of these work together to make a bike useful. But they all have different properties and those properties can change. Uh, a mountain bike has got different properties and different elements that are important than a road bike. Um, a commuter bike is different as well, as is a bike for young children, maybe made out of plastic and so it's lighter and things of that nature. Uh, and then you've got tricycles and monowheels and there's a whole range of different other um, possibilities around the concept of a bicycle. And I've given you a little video clip looking at how bicycles themselves can be used in other systems as a transportation system for the rider, but also as a delivery um, device for carrying large heavy loads, as an ambulance, as a school bus. There's a whole range of other purposes that we could put a bicycle to. So these are things that you could explore. And then we could use moonshot thinking and explore things like a flying bicycle or a bicycle that can work on water, which happens to exist. So there are a range of different ways we can explore just the simple concept of a bicycle. So whatever problem students are trying to solve and explore, system thinking can allow them to explore the interrelated elements of that problem. Now, there are a range of different techniques that we can use to assist in this. Now, the first thing is that we have interconnected systems. Often we think about things in a linear event oriented way. This happens, which causes an effect on something else, which causes something else to happen. Most things in the world, though, don't happen as simply as that. There is a complex interway, interweaving of various um, systems and a change in one element of a system will affect changes in other elements of that system itself, but also in aspects of other systems. And this process is something that we explore. First, looking at change over time. First thing we need to understand is that everything changes. Um, this comes back into some of the concepts we explored in futures thinking. But 
one of the things we often do in systems thinking is we graph things. So we look at what's happening and we try to work out how it's changing over time. Similar to what we talked about before around seasons and um, getting hotter and colder or changes in um, weather patterns and so forth. We can explore things as things changing. So the first concept students need to have is that things change. Now, one of the tools we use in systems thinking is um, stock flow diagrams. Now, a stock is a value that changes. It goes up and down. We can think of it like a bucket and we can add more water into the bucket or we can take water out of the bucket. It has a, a variable amount of, of water in that and it's called a stock. Now, a flow is where a stock can move from one bucket to another bucket. So we could say that we have a whole lot of water in this bucket and we might be putting it into another bucket. Now, an example of that might be uh, population. Let's say we have a whole population of rabbits. So we've got um, in one bucket the number of rabbits being born. In another bucket might be the number of rabbits dying. And so they have a relationship to one another. The more rabbits that are born, the more rabbits there will be that die. But likewise, the more rabbits that die, the fewer rabbits will be born. So they have, in this case, what's called a balancing relationship. Um, and we actually end up with a stable ecosystem whereby the system gets to an equilibrium where the number of rabbits being born and the number of rabbits dying will um, balance one another. Now, this is called a stock flow diagram when we, when we draw it out. Now, stock flow diagrams can be a little bit complex to jump straight into and, and engage with. So a tool we use is called a connection circle. I've given you a little video clip that explains connection circles. But essentially, we think about all the things that are important with a problem. We put them on the outside of a circle. And then we draw lines representing relationships between those elements. So let's say an example of um, making French fries. The more French fries we make, the more money we might make. So making French fries would be one thing, uh, or the number of French fries would be one thing. Um, and the amount of money made would be another thing. But we might have another factor called um, the amount of weight customers put on. So the more French fries we make, the more money we make, but it also affects the amount of um, weight that our customers have. And the more weight that the customers have, the maybe the more hospitalizations they require. And so then we draw an arrow to that. So we start thinking about all the things that might relate to the problem and if they have a relationship, we draw arrows. Now, the arrows can either be positive or negative. If um, the effect of one thing going up causes another thing to go up, so let's say more French fries being sold will mean the amount of money we earn goes up. So both of, that's a positive. Uh, but the, if we had another um, thing that was being affected, say customer's health, the more French fries we sell, if it goes up, the customer health value would go down. So that would be a negative relationship and we'd put a little minus arrow. And by, by drawing those arrows out, we can then see that the arrows actually form, once we have enough of them down, can form circles where they all link up and all the arrows go in the same direction. And that becomes what's called a causal loop. And we can then model that, which we'll see in a moment. So we're trying to identify these causal loops and we can then model those in stock flow diagrams. Now, it all seems relatively complex, but in reality, it's actually a very simple process. Now, some of the term terminology is going to be new, but very young children can work with this quite easily. The ultimate aim of doing these are to create simulations where we can try out different things. What if we sold fewer French fries? How does that affect the overall system? It might mean we make less money, but it might mean that people are healthier and they're, of course they're more healthy, they might come and buy more French fries. So we might end up making more money, even though it seemed initially that we would be losing money. So by looking at the overall impact of the system, um, because all of our customers weren't dying or being sent off the hospital, 
the, um, the results may end up surprisingly different by having a greater understanding of the system. Now, how can we do this with young children? Now, I've given you a number of examples. The first is a bird feeder example, just to show how by looking at the complex system and all the different things and how they relate to one another, we can start seeing some surprising outcomes. So in this particular outcome, what was unexpected was that having more um, birds in our garden could actually result in some other negatives happening, such as rodents and weeds. Um, and I'll let you explore the, the model and see why that occurs. So it's useful to build these models to understand unintended consequences. Now, the next example is around using it with very young students in years one and two, looking at friendships and conflict and how we can use simple systems thinking to understand the process of making friends and also of losing friends and how that's OK, but also how we can have conflict and how we can try to avoid conflict or diffuse conflict when it does occur. And again, there's a little video clip for you to explore and look at that issue. And finally, using um, uh, system modeling and systems thinking to explore complex stories. And in this case, it's a relatively simple story uh, for, called the waterhole, where animals come and drink from a waterhole. And we look at the stock and flow of the number of animals and the, and the amount of water in the waterhole and how that changes over time and the consequences of that. If, if, if there's not enough water, then the animals will disappear or they'll die. Um, and so the whole range of different things that we can be ex explore around that concept by using uh, um, systems thinking. So systems thinking is a, a, a skill that students use to better understand the problems that they're solving. That's what we use it for in technologies education. It can be used for a much wider exploration of concepts. And I've given you some resources that you can explore into that if you wish. But for our purposes in this course, we utilize system thinking so that students can better understand the, the context of the problem that they're solving and come up with um, more creative and innovative solutions to those problems.